Welcome back to the Health Longevity Secret Show, and I'm your host, Dr. Robert Lufkin. We've heard about a number of biomarkers that can assess Alzheimer's disease risk before the onset of cognitive impairment or memory loss. These include such tests as magnetic resonance scans for hippocampal volume loss or brain glucose uh, utilization, as well as genetic testing for APOE4 alleles. Another possible biomarker that is even more easily examined than any of the above is simply the person's speech linguistic patterns. Elif Iagos has an exceptional multidisciplinary background with degrees in philosophy, a bachelor's degree, cognitive science, a master's degree, linguistics, a master's degree, computer science, a master's degree, and a PhD. After she completed her education, she joined IBM in 2014 and now works at Watson Labs as a researcher. Before we start the episode, if you like what you hear, please consider supporting the work we do as well as joining us on your personal health longevity journey. You can do both by becoming a member of our community. The benefits include a private messaging area, live QA sessions, weekly premiere videos, product discounts, free giveaways, and much more. You can join for as little as $1 per month, and the first month is free. See the link in the show notes for more information. And now, please enjoy this presentation by Dr. Elif Iagos. What is very novel about our study is that this specific data set made it possible for us to apply these mature techniques to this uh, data set and for us to discover these uh, biomarkers uh, for prediction of future onset of Alzheimer's disease in speech. So if there would be an automated system, an app or some other way of you know, collecting uh, data points on how they feel that way and how are they, their symptoms that way, and if their doctors could see these or automatically there will be a system to analyze these uh, data points collected every day, they, it, the system can warn the patient saying, hey, your situation is going worse, don't wait two months to go see your doctor, go see your doctor this week. A key priority in Alzheimer's disease research is the identification of early intervention strategies that will decrease the risk, delay the onset, or slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. While many variables have been associated with risk of Alzheimer's disease, there is still a great need for the development of cheap reliable biomarkers of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Aging-related cognitive decline manifests itself in almost all aspects of language comprehension and production. The aim of this study is to test to what extent linguistic performance at a single time point can be utilized as a prognostic marker of future diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in cognitively normal subjects. We use data from the Framingham Heart Study, a large cohort longitudinal study spanning several decades. As a part of Framingham Heart Study, qualifying participants were administered a neuropsychological test battery and successive visits, which included the cookie theft picture description task from the Boston aphasia diagnostic examination. We applied computational techniques to extract linguistic variables from written responses to the cookie theft picture description task and compared their prognostic value with that of more traditional clinical variables that could easily be obtained in the screening period of a clinical trial, including neuropsychological test scores, demographic and genetic information, and medical history. Using the variables obtained, when the participants were assessed to be cognitively normal, we developed models to predict whether or not a particular participant will develop mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease on or before 85 years old. We compared the predictive ability of linguistic variables with that of more traditional variables associated with high risk for Alzheimer's disease.
The Framingham Heart Study is a well-documented, community-based cohort study initiated in 1948 with the purpose of longitudinal monitoring of participants' health. Participants undergone neuropsychological examinations every five or six years since 1999. Annual neurologic and neuropsychological examinations were performed when cognitive decline was reported by a family member of the participant, upon referral by a physician, or by the investigators of the Framingham Heart Study, or after review of the participant's medical records. The test battery included the cookie theft picture description task from the Boston Aphasia Diagnostic Examination in which participants were asked to write down the description of the cookie theft picture. Picture description tasks are commonly used to assess discourse in subjects with disorders such as aphasia and dementia. Given its sensitivity to cognitive impairments, cookie theft picture description task has become the most frequently used picture description task in clinical settings. The neuropsychological test battery resulted in a dementia rating, which represented the impression of the examiner who administered the test battery. Therefore, the dementia rating obtained from administration of a neuropsychological test battery was not a diagnosis. In addition, a dementia review panel of at least one neurologist and one neuropsychologist reviewed possible cognitive decline and dementia cases among the participants of the study. While the dementia ratings obtained from the neuropsychological testing were not diagnoses, the Dementia Review Panel did determine the diagnosis dates from mild, moderate, and severe Alzheimer's disease, as well as the date of cognitive impairment onset for the participants it reviewed. Diagnosis of dementia was based on criteria from DSM-4, and diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease was based on criteria from NINCDS, a DRDA. To fit predictive models of future diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, we had to determine which participants to label as cases and which to label as controls. In this study, the onset of Alzheimer's disease was defined as the onset of mild cognitive impairment in a participant who later received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Mild cognitive impairment is a heterogeneous condition, however, for mild cognitive impairment patients who eventually convert to Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment is considered by many to represent early-stage Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease patients who develop mild cognitive impairment on or before age 85 were defined as cases. We define the normal aging group as the participants who were recorded to be dementia-free on or after age 85. Alzheimer's disease patients whose onset of mild cognitive impairment was after 85 years old were defined as the very late onset Alzheimer's disease group. The control group was defined as the combination of the normal aging group and the very late onset Alzheimer's disease patients. The control group is shown as the blue box in the figure, and the cases are shown as the red box in the figure. According to this definition, all cases have already developed cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease at 85, and none of the controls have developed cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease at 85, as depicted in the figure. We identified a clinically defined test set by using the dementia reviews to label cases and controls. We selected one picture description task from each case and matched it to a picture description task collected in a control participant of approximately the same age, gender, and level of education. In the test set, we included only samples collected prior to any cognitive impairment onset when the subjects were cognitively normal. For the test cases, the mean time to diagnosis with mild Alzheimer's disease from cognitive normality 
was 7.59 years with standard deviation of 4.91, and the mean time to cognitive impairment onset from cognitive normality was 3.93 years with standard deviation of 3.16 We automatically computed psycholinguistic variables using natural language processing techniques. These psycholinguistic variables have been identified in literature as discriminatory variables for already demented patients. Syntactic complexity was assessed through analysis of parsed trees. Semantic content was assessed through analysis of participants' mention of information content units. Propositional idea density analysis was used to quantify syntactic and semantic complexity. Misspellings, use of punctuation, and uppercasing were analyzed to assess writing performance and style. Language modeling analyses were performed to model the distributions of word sequences. Verbosity, lexical richness, and repetitiveness was assessed by using metrics such as number of words, number of unique words, and frequencies of repetitions. We compared the predictive performance of the linguistic variables with more traditional clinical variables that could easily be obtained in the screening period of a clinical trial. The non-linguistic variables were age, gender, education, number of APOE alleles, two binary indicator variables capturing evidence of hypertension or diabetes, and 32 variables resulting from the neuropsychological tests. The Framingham Heart Study data available to us included a dementia review for only 39% of participants. As a result, only 80 of the participants qualified for inclusion in the test set. This left a very large number of participants unused. In order to obtain a larger data set, we resorted to utilizing a semi-supervised learning approach. While most of the participants did not have dementia review data allowing for definitive labeling of cases, a dementia rating was available for the majority of the administration of the neuropsychological test battery. Dementia ratings were not clinical diagnoses, however we created a training set using the dementia ratings, albeit with noisy labels. On the contrary, our test set included only clinically defined labels from dementia reviews based on clinical diagnosis. In the semi-supervised learning terminology, our test dataset was ground truth labeled, while our training dataset was weakly labeled. The semi-supervised learning approach allowed us to include 703 samples from 270 participants in our study, where a dataset consisting of a single sample from 80 participants was held out for testing. Further, we upsampled the weekly labeled training data to balance the number of samples in each class, allowing us to use more than 1,000 samples for training. Before training predictive models, variable selection was performed strictly on the training data by using an univariate test between the preclinical Alzheimer's disease cases and the control groups for each variable, and eliminating variables that were not statistically significant. We trained models on the weekly labeled training data and then validated the models on the ground truth labeled test data. We experimented with logistic regression, SVM and naive Bayes classifiers. To assess whether linguistic variables associated with the time to diagnosis with mild Alzheimer's disease, we used Cox proportional hazards models. Date of mild Alzheimer's disease diagnosis was obtained from the dementia review. The participants who were recorded as dementia-free in their dementia review were censored. Models for each single linguistic variable included as additional covariates of age, gender, and education. For the Cox proportional hazards analysis, we used 143 participants, of which 28 were censored, with a total of 1159 person years, where average was 8.1 years per person.
to identify possible longitudinal trends present in our multidimensional assessment of cognitive status, we implemented a non-negative matrix factorization analysis. For this analysis, we use the cases in the normal aging participants who have a record of cognitive impairment onset in their dementia review. The time intervals between successive visits per participant varied significantly. In order to align the data set around the date of cognitive impairment onset, we created synthetic samples by linear interpolation with a frequency of six months. This upsampling method allowed us to have a data point for each six-month interval around the date of cognitive impairment onset for each participant. We then used non-negative matrix factorization on the upsampled data set. For this analysis, we used all neuropsychological variables and linguistic variables that were statistically significant either on the test set, on the training set, or with the Cox proportional hazards model analysis. We obtained AUC of 0.74 and accuracy of 0.70 using linguistic variables alone. We observed a 10-point increase in accuracy obtained by adding linguistic variables to the non-linguistic variables, as non-linguistic variables alone obtained accuracy of 0.59, and the combination of linguistic and non-linguistic variables obtained accuracy of 0.69. The z-score indicated that AUC of 0.74 corresponds to a 4.26-fold increase in predictability over chance. The results of the Cox proportional hazards analysis showed that using the referentially generic terms instead of more specific words was associated with higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. For example, referring to the boy in the picture as a son instead of a boy is more referentially specific. Similarly, referring to the girl in the picture as a daughter instead of a girl and referring to the woman in the picture as a mother instead of a woman is more referentially specific. The figure shows the result of the non-negative matrix factorization analysis. The black arrow is pointing to the date of cognitive impairment onset on the horizontal axis. The participants' visits were aligned at their date of cognitive impairment onset for this analysis. The data was upsampled to have a data point for each six-month interval before and after the date of cognitive impairment onset for each participant. Accordingly, the x-axis in the figure shows each six-month interval, and y-axis shows the loading of each six-month interval on the first component obtained by non-negative matrix factorization. The blue line shows the control's progression and time. The red line shows the case's progression and time, with a steeper decline for the cases, especially after the cognitive impairment onset. Similar comparative disease progression models were suggested in the literature for controls versus Alzheimer's disease patients. The linguistic variables that we identified as most relevant for predicting future onset of Alzheimer's disease were prominently agraphia, telegraphic speech, and repetitiveness. These have been consistently identified in the literature as associated with cognitive decline in dementia. Another linguistic element that has been associated with Alzheimer's disease was referential specificity. Referential specificity was identified as having a strong weight in the Cox proportional hazards analysis. It has been hypothesized that using referentially specific terms, as opposed to more general terms, requires making inference, therefore it is more demanding on the cognitive resources. For example, referring the woman in the cookie theft picture as a mother requires making an inference about the relationships between the subjects in the picture. This result is supported by a large number of studies showing that semantic impairments are among the earliest linguistic markers of dementia. 
verbosity and lexical richness metrics, which stand out as strong markers of cognitive impairment in already demented patients, were not among the strong predictors of future diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in cognitively normal individuals in our study. Our study differs from similar studies in various ways. First, our prediction is based on data collected, while the participants were cognitively healthy. Second, we focus exclusively on variables readily attainable as part of the screening phase of an early intervention trial, and assess predictive performance using only linguistic metrics derived from a single administration of a picture description task. Simple, naturalistic, and inexpensive speech probes, as our results suggest, can provide an assistive tool for the early detection and progression monitoring of Alzheimer's disease, particularly given that such probes can be easily adapted to remote digital platforms with low patient burden. No, this is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking of it because of something you have seen here. If you find this to be of value of you, please hit that like button and subscribe to support the work we do on this channel. Also, we take your suggestions and advice very seriously. Please let us know what you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching and we'll hope to see you next time!